plantation system in the United States reached its greatest development before the Civil War. By 1860, plantations reached from Virginia to Texas. The enormous amount of hand labor required to grow and pick the cotton was supplied by great numbers of slaves. This then was the economic background of the plantation. Cheap slave labor producing one main crop on vast tracts of land owned by the planter. Great changes in the plantation system occurred during the war. The freeing of the slaves and the great financial burden of the war disrupted the economic pattern. But the plantation system did not entirely disappear. Some elements of that system did not change. The land, cultivated for generations and still productive, remained. The source of labor, great numbers of Negroes, remained. The demand for cotton remained, and the growing of cotton continued. So the plantation system, in a smaller and modified way, continued and can be found in the South today. My name is Ruby M. Sanders. I was born in 1935 in Sumter, South Carolina. My husband was a worker, but he was a plantation worker. And we was having hard times, you know, trying to make a living yeah, on the plantation. And um, it was not easy. And we got in debt, and my husband got involved with the long shops, and um, he couldn't pay the bills, so we leave. We le left South Carolina, came to Philadelphia, and he got it. my husband got a job up here doing construction work with his brother. But at the time, we moved into a one-bedroom apartment with seven children at the time. And we stayed there for a while until we tried to find a house. And later on, I guess three or four years, we did find a house. Because we was cramped up in a two-bedroom house with eight children at the time. <laughs> Because I had another baby after candy for it, I had eight. So um, then I had another baby too. Well, I had 12 children, matter of fact. I had 12 children, but those were the ones I had then. And this also was in a two bedroom with cold heat, and we didn't have much heat, and we wasn't able to buy coals because my husband ain't had a good job at it at the time. So somebody in view, in view of us, it's like y'all in viewing us now, and that's how I got the house down on Paris Street. That was my happy day, and my children were so happy. They came, they ran all upstairs, downstairs, what room they could sleep in, who could sleep in this room. And the people was nice, the neighbors was nice. It was beautiful. I didn't want to leave my house after I've been there for 50 some years. That's how long I've been there, because my son was three years old when I moved there in 1967. And he um, was 53 now. Francisville is halfway North Philly and halfway Center City is like the split point in between. It's construction that's going on all over this neighborhood. Even that's happening now as this interview is being conducted, that's like a process of reunification. It's like almost every rooftop, it's my own, every rooftop, or cutting every pavement up. But the people that's living in the neighborhoods is not going to them houses. They can't afford no $200,000 house.
really doing is if you own your house and you're a senior citizen living off of disability or a fixed income, one way they can get rid of you through the regentrification process is to raise the cost of your utilities. That's if you own your house. If you are a renter, it just raises the cost of your rent. So you're no longer able to afford to stay even if you wanted to. So you don't have to either move or sell your property. At the end of the day, you're displacing lifelong community members from their communities and just send them anywhere. A lot of the people, they're sending them further to like Northeast, out of the way. You ain't gotta see that many niggas like that. Out of the way. <laughs> you ain't gotta see that many of them. We can move them farther. So they're moving them farther from Center City. Don't get me wrong, the mural itself, it looks cool. But what they do in these neighborhoods, they put these murals up here and they put these African-American faces up here, whatever, and you know, sort of have curb appeal. So when people move in, they go, oh, we got murals and all that kind of stuff. But the faces that you see on these murals are disappearing quickly. You know, Mr. Rocky Dezazio, everybody used to call him Mr. Rocky. And uh, he is called, known as a refrigerator place because he used to sell used washing machines, used refrigerators. So people in the neighborhood that can't afford brand new uh, appliances, they have somewhere to go and take their microwaves, heaters, uh, 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 furnaces, water heaters, washing machines, dryers, you know, to come get fixed. And you know what I mean now, with all that gone, where can they go? and they, they said it wouldn't cost me nothing to move, they would move me. It ain't like I want to move, they would move me here and I had certain at the time to get the stuff together to get out of the house. I couldn't buy the house, not now at my age, because I'm 81 plus now, so I couldn't, I ain't buy no house starting at 81 years old. I spent the rest of my life trying to pay for a house, so I didn't, I would I wish I could have bought the house. I told them I done been there 50 years, I already bought the house, paying rent all of many years, but they said that ain't doing, it, it didn't matter how many years somebody be in the house from time to move, they said you had to move. So the years I've been there didn't mean nothing good. And I kept the house up in good condition, everything. Everybody thought I, was, I owned the house. But that's how I kept the house up, and it, you know, while I was there. It's not about us though. That's what you gotta realize. They're looking at it, about it's about money, dollars with them. So you think they care about the neighborhood, the history, what was going on in that neighborhood before they came. So I live, I live, I live amongst these people. We don't have conversations with them. So you think they here to really make friends and really, that's not what it is. This area, this is 16th and Ridge in North Philly, but this, on this corner used to be a pool hall here for the neighborhood kids to come and have some place to go, hang out, play video games, listen to music, play pool, and now, you know, kids don't have nowhere to go but the streets. No difference as them shutting the schools down now in favor of condominiums. It's America. <laughs> That's what it's about, money. They don't care about the neighborhood. They just know this is a good business plan, good business opportunity. So the gentrifiers, I just look at them like blood suckers. They know what they doing. They know how these neighborhoods was before they came to it. In the 1980s, Francisville was a close-knit community with maybe more than 10 or 15 big families. And when I say big families, it might have been, you know, grandmothers with nine, 10 kids, you know, that had kids themselves. So it was an area with a lot of kids, a lot of friends, a lot of places to play, a lot of people to see, and a, a great place to grow up. It was stoves all up Ridge Avenue. 
My grandson met my son, but anyway, we didn't have to go into town to do any shop, anything. They had everything on the Ridge Avenue. Clothes and stuff, everything was on the avenue. We didn't have to go in town for nothing. And uh, as the neighborhood started declining, when a lot of the blacks started moving up here from, you know, down the southern states looking for a better life, they started moving into Francisville. And that's when the white people started moving out because the appeal of the neighborhood considered that them started declining because, you know, blacks are not considered to be living in a, a curbside appeal community. People start moving out, and moving out, and the neighbors start going down, 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 like they've been down so fast, I can't even remember. All the stores, you know, start closing down. Cause we had clothes and stuff, food stores, the farmers market, we had all those on the avenue and stuff like that. People still looked out for each other. There was a lot of good things going on. There was a lot of co-parenting going on. And it brings you back to the saying, it takes a community to raise a child. So if I was a child, my parent also parented me. And if you saw me out in the streets, you parented me too. And I couldn't talk back to you because you told my parents. And my parents, yeah, I, I got in trouble when I went home. Mm -hmm. So that was a process of co-parenting. And those things just uh, corroded when the drugs, uh, drug issues. When drugs start to come in, into the neighborhood, I didn't really know too much about drugs then because I'm from the South. I didn't know what drugs or what, what was what. But I know it was drugs in the neighborhood because they start sitting on my steps um, selling drugs and smoking drugs and drinking beer. And, uh, but I told them, I said, look, y'all can't do that on my steps. I ain't want no smoke coming through my windows like that and, and y'all leaving your food and, you, and leaving the beer bottles and stuff. My grandson was sitting right by my steps and in the morning I had to get up and clean. People had no respect then for people I was in. You know they do. But they did move when I asked them to move though. They were moving. When I turned around, they are right back on the step again. Once the crack era came, it seemed like it just, overnight, it just swept this whole neighborhood up. It seemed like just a matter of the summer coming and it seemed like everybody was on crack and it just tore this whole neighborhood up because if you got parents that's heavily addicted to crack cocaine they not going to probably be able to take care of their children or their household or whatever and you had people losing jobs losing homes being evicted i lost uh three of my children got but well, they didn't got shot enough but three of my children died but while I was on Pad Street. One of my grandson got shot right around the corner on Pad when I was living there on Pad Street. It was about drugs or something. I think he went around to pay the guy off or something. The guy shot him there. And we didn't know it till the next day. I heard the gunshot, but I didn't know it was my grandson. Until um, somebody came that night and said, you know your grandson got shot. And I didn't even know that, and that was news to me here. And then, you know, that was the only one got shot at the time around the corner on, on the avenue. Doing the drug thing for going on then, yeah, back then. Yeah. yeah, the first time I seen somebody get shot, it was me and my grandmother. You know, she took me to get a haircut, you know, after we come from getting a haircut. You know, I'm a kid, I wanted ice cream, we arguing back and forth, what flavor I'm gonna get. So she like, let's get whatever you want. Then a guy runs past. Then another guy's chasing him down with a gun, and he shot him. That was the first time I seen somebody get shot. And that incident right there was like a loss, of, a loss of my innocence as a child. That's what I, when I really knew, like, <laughs> I'm not a kid no more. Like, this is like a real something real that's happened. Like seeing somebody really get shot. So I knew I didn't live in like a regular neighborhood. Like this is. Mm, this is some real bad stuff. Like, damn, somebody just got shot. So I was seven years old when I first seen somebody get shot, and that day changed me.
lot of the black neighborhoods, Spanish neighborhoods, they're poverty stricken. And that's all that they know. So if people want to really see how America is, they should come and see for themselves like, damn, this is not the America that we was told. Like, no, this is something totally different. This is not the America that I wanted to see. Some of these neighborhoods is like third world countries. Some of these cities in America are like third world countries. You got to see the real America, not all that bougie, bourgeois shit. Like, no, we talking about real hood, you know? And America is a hood. We in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia. Tell them I'm putting a bill. 6,800, they see this low man. They see low man 10 right here. 4,700 murder vibe, baby. See that corner right there? Whole lot of bodies dropped there. Right. This is what we call this. Killer death. This is killer death. All right, this is just true. All right, yo, this shit, shit, this shit a killer. Be killed though. Hey, Him as you can find over Baghdad. It's fucked up, but where I'm from, this shit will get that Chris bad. Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia. Keep that 17 and wild out, man. Niggas know what it is. Niggas know what we do, man. Rolling through the city, that's the new Iraq. Yeah, nigga, this how we rollin', no doubt, my man. 1700, man, you heard me. Afghanistan, nigga. Nigga, talking that band shit, we got bands on deck. This shit just blow shit. 17 from the Afghan, say wild bosses, what it is, baby. Round up, man. Honey shot banger. Honey shot banger. DV boys, DV boys. Kelly changed they used to hang us from the trees. You think they give a damn if you want to kill your man for some cheese? The key word is loyalty, and I ain't seen nothing in the wild. Seen a nigga sell his soul for a pound. Bitches kill their kids, and niggas keep raping all the chicks. But book my man, cause he was breaking down a brick. It don't make sense, but it's gonna make dollars for me. And I keep my ass to the streets, so you can holler for me. Fuck out of here. Seem like the war on drugs was essentially a joke. It's just a, a, a statistic. So you're treating people's lives as statistics. So if you got a quota to fill, I'm not looking at human lives, I'm just looking at numbers. I gotta lock 10 people up today. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm definitely gonna lock 10 people up today. And that's just the attitude of the police. And this is why you're seeing guys going to jail for uh, uh, being provoked. I'm getting pulled over and being told to shut up and all that. It's like you're being provoked just so you can be, in, you know, be taken to jail. United States, they got this so-called war on drugs. We know that means war on the black community. There's no such thing as a war on drugs because the whole no goddamn economy is, is built off of drugs. Yep. Say no to drugs. Just say no. <laughs> the enemy, illegal drugs. The war on drugs. In the past 10 years, arrests have gone up nearly 50%. But the number of users and the supply of drugs has stayed about the same. 85% of those affected by this are African Americans. I realize that a lot of young African American men are locked up over petty crime, and in most cases, over no crime, just locked up. It's hard for us women, you know what I'm saying, to be out here and, and try to make it as a family, and they and how they got this economy going where it takes two people in order to keep a house and to run stuff and just to have a, a normal house. But we can't do that because they locking all our men up for unjustifiable reasons, okay? Then, if they not locking them up, they shooting them. Our men are in jails, and now they're shipping our men to uh, Wisconsin in prison. So now they don't get no visits from family members. So it's easy for them to brutalize our men when they're far away. Because yep. they don't have nobody coming checking up on them, nobody sees them, right? Right. What we, as women, because women usually hold things together when the men can't, 
then crack came in, then the women started losing Isaiah and all that stuff. But this crack epidemic, it set us back. It set us, it set us so far back, I'm serious. It set us so far back to now we got a whole generation with no fathers. That affects our fathers, that affects a brotherhood in our community that affects that male presence that we need here in the community. It locked up a lot of people in my neighborhood then, yeah. That it was less and less men in the, in the community in the neighborhood. Ain't too many men in the neighborhood now. Most of that, you know, single people, really. I can count the men who are really you know, living on that block in the neighborhood now. Because a lot of them did rent the jail and stuff. You know? I received a 20 year sentence, which I served 13 years and eight months for. And I'm currently on parole. And I'll be off August 17th of 2017. And even that situation, I'm still doing time from a case that happened over 20 years ago. The link between locking people up and gentrifying people's neighborhoods is uh, if a man got a record, he can't live in a Philadelphia Housing Authority house. So therefore, you know what I mean? Any woman that may be living in a Philadelphia Housing Authority house, she has a chance to be evicted if the Philadelphia Housing Authority found out that she had a person with a criminal record living in the house with her. It's like right now, if I wanted to uh, apply for um, housing with the Philadelphia Housing Authority, I couldn't. I was arrested for drugs, even though it was over 20 years ago. I think gentrification targets high crime areas because if there's crime, property value goes down. I think they wait for a lot of killing, a lot of drugs to come into the communities. Once a lot of people kill each other, once drugs destroy people in that community, then they come in. Property value is down, so they can buy these properties dirt cheap and sell them at a higher price later on. So gentrification is just, man, like they target high crime areas. They know what areas to come into. They know what areas to, they, you know, they decide like, all right, this area right here, it's still a good area, but there's a lot of niggas here. A lot of Puerto Rican, Spanish people here, they're going to kill each other. They're going to sell drugs. Eventually, they're going to kill so many, you know, so many people die in these neighborhoods. They look at it like, man, eventually we're going to take the area from them. They come in here and buy these properties for dirt cheap and sell them at a higher price. So it's business. It's business to them. They don't care about the neighborhood. They just know, you know, it's good real estate. People done killed each other off, you know, now we can make money from it. Drugs and murder. That's what destroyed these neighborhoods and they capitalize off that. This repair that happens to the community because of the crack era, they never repaired those houses. And speaking on Francis Street, you got houses on Francis Street that goes for over $200,000 that they didn't start repairing into the uh, uh, late 90s but they've been in disrepair since the mid 80s. They didn't care about this neighborhood one bit until Governor Rendell, when he was mayor of Philadelphia, Ed Rendell, when he allowed a 10 year tax exemption on any business owner or company that wanna come in here and build condos or properties in the city. Of course the developer's gonna come in, here, in the city and build telling me I can't pay, I don't have to pay taxes for 10 years?
it's always been part of the plan to destroy black and Latino neighborhoods. Like, come on, man. They know what's going on in these neighborhoods. Like, people always say, we don't have no planes. We don't have no ships to bring this stuff in. Like, you know, where you think we get this stuff from? Where you think we get drugs from? Where you think we get guns from? You know? We all know no drug could get in this United State without somebody letting them in. We all know no black man don't bring it here. They want to make it worse for us. Real shit, dog. The government put this shit here and then they get mad when we sell this shit. I can remember selling drugs and cops pulled me over and put me on the wall and pat me down. And I think I about had about, probably about $800 worth of cocaine in my pocket. I remember a cop going in my pocket taking the drugs out and said, uh, what you doing with the soup? Get out of here. I left. I'm not going to jail, so I don't care if he got it, you know what I mean? Because he could have took the cocaine and took me to jail, but all right, I'll leave. But cops like that, all they do is they, you're going to use the drugs or you're going to find somebody else that you hate, that you've been wanting to plant or bust for a long time, and they plant the drugs on them. Or they'll take the drugs and take your money and let you go, so they keep your money and keep the drugs. So if you're a drug dealer, trust me, one time in your life, you ran across some corrupt cops. Three police officers from Philadelphia are in federal custody. They're charged with plotting with drug dealers to stage a traffic stop and steal $15,000 worth of heroin and then resell the drug. The 14-count indictment identifies the officers as Mark Williams, James Venziali, and Robert Snyder. Also named were Snyder's wife and three suspected drug dealers. And the big story on Action News is another arrest in the corruption case involving the Philadelphia Police Department. Authorities now say two former partners were working together to rob drug dealers. Six Philadelphia police officers now face decades behind bars. And what officials there are calling one of the worst corruption cases in decades. Mind you, this is Philadelphia. They seem to know a little bit about corruption there. Here are the pictures of the six cops, and what they're accused of is unbelievable. All six, either current or former narcotics officers. Over the years, the feds say they stole more than half a million dollars in drugs and cash and other stuff from suspects. But that's really just the beginning. Investigators say these men often beat and kidnapped suspects. In one incident, investigators say an officer dangled a man over the edge of an 18th story balcony to get information. Well, federal prosecutors here say the alleged misconduct of the six narcotics officers was far worse than any of the crimes ever committed by the drug suspects they were supposed to be arresting. Police officers that are supposed to serve and protect ride the community as an occupying army. They rob people, they infringe on people's rights, they terrorize and bully families, they kick down doors, they take people's property. They humiliate people, they strip them, they spread rumors, they cause conflict among the neighborhood. We are at war with the cops in America, not just in Philly, and you know, America, period. Like, the cops always been the enemies of the people. They never did good for the neighborhoods. A community, that's when you had cops that pull you over, or whether you're walking or you're driving, and you had those questions like, uh, uh, what you doing, where you going? And if you're minding your business, or if you say you're minding your business, it's, oh, it might lead to something else. That's how you have a lot of incidents of police brutality. And that's still in effect to this day. And with the regentrification, you have community members that lived in this neighborhood over 30 years getting treated and stalked like they don't even live in this neighborhood. We from, we from this kind of neighborhood, we got this color skin, so automatically we guilty, you know what I'm saying? Automatically we guilty. Alrighty, I just had the cops take the cuffs off of me about three hours ago. Why? 
I'm a black man, no ID, walking the neighborhood. Now, got my ID in my pocket. That's crazy though. Well, Only yeah. thing I'm asking is, leave a black man alone, let me do me. I'ma keep on working. I don't sell drugs, don't smoke drugs, don't fuck with it, I got kids. Another way they displace people out of community too is they throw up the no loitering signs. You know what I mean? That further displaced people out of the community because before, you see how the community members sit around, they sit on each other's steps. Like, I can go, like, it's families over here. I know, but I can just walk down the street and just sit on the steps. I can just chill on the steps. But let's say the cops roll up right now and just be like, you lit it? No, but I know the neighbors. You got the roll. I'll get a violation if I don't leave because they threw up the no loitering sign. But even though this is my community that I live in every day, I'm not even allowed to sit on my neighbor's steps, even though my neighbor's cool with me. St. Joseph's Hospital, been in the area for years, so that was like a local neighborhood hospital. But uh, Temple University had bought out the hospital. They closed down back in April 2016. Penn High School was located in North Philadelphia at Broad Master Street. Temple had bought the uh, property in favor of putting a uh, Temple Sports Complex. But they basically displaced high school students and they made promises to the public by saying that the facility was going to be open to the public. But it's not open to the public, it's just open to uh, Temple students only. My parents told us the truth about the realities of America. She didn't sugarcoat it. She told us, you know, our people were stolen from Africa. We were displaced. That don't make us American. We were, we're, we were, we were Africans who were stolen. Does that make you an American? I don't care how long we're here. That don't make us American. We're still African. We might be African, I mean, American, you know, like we had to adapt to their culture, but America know that we're not American. Why you think they treat us like that? We've been here as long as anybody else. Philly is planning on shutting down 23 public schools, which is a complete and utter disaster. They're actually going to decrease the amount of public schools in Philly by 10%. And the reason why they're doing so is because, well, it turns out that they just don't have the money, except they have $400 million to build a new penitentiary. Why don't they just take what the kids that were in the school and just put them right into the penitentiary, right? <laughs> just to make the system a little bit more efficient. I, I mean, I feel like that's what they're planning. The school to prison pipeline is no joke. It's, it's a real thing that you're seeing here in the U.S. right now, where kids, and usually minority kids, will get uh, suspended or expelled for stupid, nonviolent offenses, and then they'll go to juvenile detention centers. Um, now, we don't know if that's actually going to happen in this particular case, but again, you're shutting down 23 public schools and you're using $400 million to fund a prison. And by the way, this will be the second most expensive state project ever. Prisons are a big business in America. So the more people that they lock up, the more they feed the prison system. It's business. You know it's a business when people invest in prisons, right? It's not some, like, oh my God, people invest in prisons, hell yeah. It's big business. They need people inside the prison to get money, right? When you shut down 23 schools in the district and you force the students to go to other schools and you have overcrowded classrooms, yeah, it turns out that the education isn't as effective. And then they will use that argument and say, well, you see that now they're failing even worse. We've got to shut more of them down and we're going to turn more of them private. Right? You know, it's, it's really depressing. And then, and then the prisons will get overcrowded, and then they'll say, well, you see, that's why we've got to build more prisons, and we've got to turn more of them into private so that they could be more efficient, and then they'll have more incentive 
to shut more schools down and create even more prisons. And this is happening all across the country, and it's sick. I'm 21 years old. I know about prison. I did six years in the state penitentiary. Six years, from 15 to 21. I've been home for two months. I know about prison. I don't know how to fill out a job application, because they never taught me that there. I don't know how to drive a car because they didn't teach me that there. They didn't teach me the things that I need in order to succeed. Compared to going to the juvenile facility and just growing. I didn't grow, I matured real fast. Six years from 15 to 21? Come on, Corbett. Come on, Corbett. Be serious. And there's many more up there. I seen a 14-year-old up there. I seen a 15-year-old up there. I seen a 20-year-old up there that got 20 to 40. He gonna do more time in jail than he already got alive. Dear Mr. Governor, my name is Lord K. Z. Law. We need to talk so I got off the seesaw. Cause I'm about to go to school, but there's no books. You cut the money to bomb the paper old crooks. He the past, Uncle Sam, I'm the future. Watch it, he get the cash, I need a tutor. It's like computers, so me and my parents can get some good jobs in the next few years. Feel me? Building prisons, adding more police, would not solve the problem at all. The problem is that you got a criminal system, and then the criminals is an authority. You got criminals that educate people into criminals, and then you got criminals that judge the people. Then you got criminals that are supposed to be administering justice to the people. Can never be no justice in that type of situation. This is America. Like they all work together. It's all the system. You can't differentiate. How? Do you differentiate cops from politicians? Politicians from governors? They all work for the same collective system. They know what's going on in this country. They know. If they wanted to make things better in these neighborhoods, they could have been did it years ago, right? So they want to keep they want to keep the hood poor. They want people to kill. They want them to sell drugs. You know? It feeds their system. After slavery, what was it? Prisons. Come on. It's not something that should be far-fetched. It's not something that people should be in the dark about. It's right there on the surface. So I look at it like all of the same system. Gentrification is just coming hard. And we can see it right before our eyes like, damn, this is like really happening. Like, yeah, it's happening. It's just bad that, you know, people that you came up with for years and years and years, you just see somebody just take their house for small amounts of money, and these people sell it for triple the price. Oh yeah, I lost a lot of weight behind it. <laughs> that thing really hurt me though when I had to move out my house. But um, I figured that's what I had to do, so I, I just had to leave. It wasn't about just me at the time. So that's why they moved me here. I've been here now six months. And I'm still trying to get used to it. <laughs> when you see these people come in your neighborhood, like we watched them like years ago. They came in, we would say they took reconnaissance. They got reconnaissance about the area. They surveyed the land, seeing what it was. And like three years later, they accomplished their uh, objectives. People started moving in and they didn't have to go through anything. Like, the community members that have been there, like she's been there 50 years, and there's other community members that have been there almost the same time that she has, and they experience all of the pluses and negatives, the drug situation, the violence and all that, and nice. the clean up, and it's like, okay, now it's nice, and nobody else had to endure all that, and it's just everybody else. <laughs> It's basically like they prepared it for them. Now they just move in and everything is set up already. They knew what they was doing. They knew that the, this neighborhood, high crime area, drugs, murder, whatever, whatever, whatever. But, but the territory, it's prime real estate, where the location, where it's at. They had to get these niggas out of here. You gotta get these spicks out of here. That's how they look at it. 
and they did it. The system will demoralize you. The system will make you feel like you don't have no power, you don't have no substance to go against their system, but in fact you do because Without us, without the people, they would have no system. They would have no power and no ability to make money. You know, we can't depend on the courts to give us justice. We can't depend on the police officers to give us justice. All we can depend on is ourselves. All we got is each other out here in these streets. All we got is each other out here in these schools. All we got is each other out here in these neighborhoods. Care about Bro. yourself. Let us unite, stop being cowards, and build a resistor movement right here in the hood. And I'm talking about overall resistance. I'm talking about get your health in order so that your body can resist disease. I'm talking about getting your mind together so that your mind can resist temptation and influence for you to destroy yourself. I'm talking about get your family together so that y'all can have a future. I'm talking about getting your community together so that you can have true security. Security would never be bought by outside forces. Security would never be bought by somebody who set up with a uniform and got a, a piece of paper with laws backing them. Security will only come from us holding each other down. Security will only come from us pitting our heads together and innovating the hood. That's what we need to do. Free the hood.